Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. We're thankful to be here to worship the Lord. We pray that uh, the Holy Ghost would move. I know he's going to move here, and I pray that he moves in your homes. We're so thankful that you've joined in tonight. We're thankful to have you and your family and your home with us as we worship the Lord together. And uh, if you have access to, uh, to your device, I pray that you would share uh, our Bethlehem Church feed tonight so we can get the word and the presence of the Lord out to as many people as possible. And we're certainly thankful that you've joined us together in the house of the Lord. And the, later on in the service, we have something uh, new that we're, we've added tonight, and that is a segment for our children's ministry. And so we hope that the children will be tuned in as well. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer, and let's just pray that he would have his way. And that uh, everywhere that this is being watched and viewed, that the presence of the Lord would turn our homes and the place where we are into a place of worship and a place where his presence can move. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, God, for your grace, for your power and presence, for the anointing of the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. God, I pray that you would move here and throughout this place, oh God. God, in every place where this service being viewed, I pray for the anointing to destroy yokes. I pray for healing, deliverance, salvation. I pray, God, for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, as we begin to worship you, God, that your presence would fill our homes and fill our hearts, Lord. God, we pray in the name of Jesus for your anointing to move. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord together. There's a better life, there's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, if you feel lost. Oh, he's a way, he's maker. A way maker. If you need freedom, you need freedom. A saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Search for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fire. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. There's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. Oh, if you feel lost. For the light of day in the dead of night We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fire We've all run to things we know just ain't right There's a better life There's a better life If you got pain, he's a pain taker Oh, if you feel lost, if you feel lost He's a chain, he's a chain breaker. Oh, if you got pain, he's a pain taker. He's a pain taker. Yes, if you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, we're saving. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Receive it. 
If you can't feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can't feel it, somebody testify. Oh, yes. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can't feel it, somebody testify. If you got pain.
Jesus. Can we lift up our hands everywhere that you're at right now? Let's lift up our hands and let's just praise him for a little bit. Come on, let's praise God for a little bit. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, I give you all the glory. I give you all the honor. I give you all the praise. I'm thankful for your grace, oh God. If it wasn't for your grace, where would I be? I thank you, God, for your grace. I praise you, Jesus. I worship you. There's no one like you. There's no one greater than you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Um, this time is, is difficult for all of us. And in our attempt to keep our congregation safe, we have changed how we have church. Um, one of the difficulties is that our children are not getting the ministry they need. So, Bethlehem Church loves its children, so we asked our National Kids Quest Director, Pastor Nathan Roberts, from Joplin, Missouri, to help provide us with something for our children. He was so gracious to send us a couple videos, so why don't you get your children ready, and please enjoy Pastor Roberts and Brianna as they um, present a, a children's video for us. Hey, I'm Nathan J with Kids Quest. This is my daughter, Brianna. <laughs> Pretty well. Here's a big little song I want you guys to help us out with. We know that you can learn how to do it, so get ready. Here we go. It's called the Serial Song. Whoa. It might sound kooky. I'm only just lucky. Jesus is what I crave. He's gold so good to me. Totally in love with me. Jesus is really great. It might sound kooky, I'm more than just lucky. Jesus is what I crave. He's all so good to me, totally in love with me. Jesus is really great. All right, here's the verse. Here's the verse. Let's see if I can do the verse without messing up. Uh, I'll try the verse. Here. Life can be sort of a uh, fruity loopy <laughs> without the Lord as your captain. The devil will use all of his tricks to kick you out of heaven. So when he comes and kicks you around and he acts all puffed square up, stand up, Pray up, and in Jesus' name, the devil will have to go snap, crackle, pop. Whoa. It might sound kooky, I'm more than just lucky. Jesus is what I pray. He's all so good to me, totally in love with me. Jesus is really. Got another verse, another verse. Here we go. It's great when we praise the Lord by raising our hands. Jesus will make you all brand new when you start serving Him. So, Cheerio, lift up your voice as praise we now, praise we now create. We just got a little hand. Jesus is more than fantastic. Ha, you didn't see that coming, did you? He is really great. great. Oh. <laughs> it might sound kooky. I'm more than just lucky. Jesus is what I pray. He's all so good to me. Totally in love with me. Jesus is really great. Oh, one more time. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm more than just lucky. Jesus is what I pray. He's all 
so good to me, totally in love with me. Jesus is really great. Jesus is really great. Yeah. Woo. If you know Jesus is great, why don't you give him a hand clap of praise? Go ahead, in your home, and make your home a sanctuary and just give God a hand clap of praise. Jesus is really great, and he's really greatly to be praised, the Bible says. Amen. Amen. We're going to receive an offering. Um, there's, there's four different ways you can give. First of all, if, you, if you're not comfortable with online giving, you can, send, you can mail it to 88 Overton School Road, Potts Camp, Mississippi. Again, you can mail it to 88 Overton School Road, Potts Camp, Mississippi. Or if you're good with technology, or if you're not very good, it's pretty simple. Just download the Faith Teams app and sign up and press the word give, and you can give from there. If that doesn't work for you, you can go to bethchurch.org, press the, the button that says give online, and you can give from there. And then there's a fourth way text to give. You text the word give to 662 200 9867. 662 200 9867. And please remember to press the cover processing fees check mark at the end of it before you press give now. We're going to pray over the offering and we're going to ask God to bless every giver and, and to, to anoint the rest of this service and have his way. Father, we thank you for bringing us together, God. Whether it be in this building or in our homes, God, we thank you for letting us experience your presence. We thank you, God, that we are able to give, that you've blessed us with enough money to be able to give. God, the fact that we have anything at all is, is, a, is a blessing, and we thank you for it, God. And God, I pray that you would bless every giver tonight, everybody that gives according to your financial, your scriptural financial plan, oh God. Because the Bible says, if we give, it shall be given unto us. Us, good measure, pressed down and shaken together, running over. God, I loose that promise of the Word of God into their lives right now in the name of Jesus. For everybody that gives, oh God, I loose that promise that you're going to give them abundantly, God. I thank you for it, God. And I pray in the name of Jesus that the Holy Ghost continue to move and that it continues to anoint this service. God, anoint Pastor Vasquez as he preaches the Word of God to us and anoint our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying unto the church tonight. Help us to be receptive. Help us to hear your word and obey your word tonight. And we thank you for what you're going to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. You can give as unto the Lord.
with all of you who are joining in tonight. And uh, we, are, we are definitely praying for our church family and all of our guests. And uh, again, we'll be live right here on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock on Facebook Live. And then again at 6.30, at 6.30 on our evening service, we have a very special treat. Brother Michael Maupin, a full-time evangelist, will be preaching on our broadcast on Sunday night at 6.30. So we're looking forward to having Brother Maupin with us. It's going to be a great time. And uh, I have been so encouraged and blessed by those who have sent in reports of great moves of God that's happened in their homes gathered with their families, times when the Holy Ghost has moved while we've been having church, while they've been gathered to watch our, our broadcast, watch our live feed. The Holy Ghost has moved and lives have been touched. And uh, we certainly thank all of you for joining in. And we believe and we pray that God will move uh, in your homes. Amen. That God will do a great work. And to, we are excited about what the Lord is doing uh, if, if for whatever reason you have friends and family that have missed our live feed, we'll have it loaded on our other platforms, our YouTube channel, SoundCloud, and our podcast. And uh, be sure that you share the Word of God as the Lord begins to move. I believe God's going to do great things. Amen. What I'm preaching tonight is something that I feel that, uh, that the Lord has given me and uh, I think, that, uh, I think that it's in tune with what the Lord's doing right now, and I pray that you'll take it as a word from the Lord for you and for your family and for your house. I'm going to read from the book of Exodus, chapter number 12 and verse number 3, and then the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11 and verse number 7. Amen. It's been an adventurous week. We've had a funeral and we pray for the Sappington family. Sister Peggy Sappington passed away and we had her funeral yesterday. Amen. We had a brother in our church have a heart attack, but thank the Lord he's doing well. We had a sister in our church, church had a wreck just before service. And, uh, and we're certainly in prayer for her. Amen. The book of Exodus chapter number 12 and verse number 3. And then to the book of Hebrews 11 and verse number 7. And again, I want to say a very special thank you to our praise and worship team, our musicians, our media team, and all those that are working so hard to make sure that, uh, that we have a quality, a quality uh, broadcast and live feed and that the Lord is moving. Thank you so much for your hard work. And to our church family, that uh, though we're unable to be together in the same building, you have certainly made your support known and felt through so many messages and kind words and prayers one for another. And, uh, and I th I'm thankful to be a part of this great church family. The book of Exodus, chapter number 12, and verse number 3. And then the book of Hebrews 11 and 7. Exodus 12 and 3. The word of God says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them Every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house, a lamb for a house. Hebrews 11 and 7, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear and prepared an ark, to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. The Bible said that Noah moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Both of these verses deal specifically with the house. The commandment for the Passover in Exodus 12 was that there had to be a lamb for a house. And in Hebrews 11 and 7, the word of God said that Noah built an ark to the saving of his house. 
I want to preach for a little while tonight on the subject house to house. House to house. Let's pray. God, I thank you, Lord, for everyone that's tuning in. God, I pray that your presence would move in a mighty way for your spirit, oh God, to touch hearts and lives tonight. God, I pray that your spirit, which knows no boundaries of time and space, God, that even right now it would begin to move in the hearts and the minds and the homes of your people. I pray for our church family, God, and I pray for every guest that's tuning in tonight. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to speak by your word, and God, I pray that you would confirm your word with signs following. I loose the gift of faith to operate, O oh God. And Lord, the Bible says that where your word, when your word comes, that faith comes by hearing. And so, God, I pray that the word would inspire faith in someone's heart and life tonight. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. God bless you. Thank you. Let me begin by saying that I firmly believe that the Bible teaches the importance of the church in the lives of Christians. It may not be popular in the modern day, but you can scripturally discern someone's spiritual condition by how faithful they are and how involved they are in their local church. An indication of Saul's spiritual condition came when the Bible told us that he spent twice as long building his own house as he did building the house of the Lord. His priorities came out. Scripture says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. That's why we didn't cancel church during this unusual time for our nation and world, we're assembling together in alternate ways for a short time. At least what we hope and pray will be a short time. In the times of Israel's sojourn through the wilderness, they were commanded to set up the tabernacle first and then build their tribes around the tabernacle with the church at the center of their lives. Make no mistake, your involvement in your local church is a sure barometer of your walk with God. The scripture says we walk together when we're in agreement with each other. And people who don't walk with their church are not in agreement with its doctrines, values, and principles. The scripture says when we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And so you can tell if we're in the light or not by how we fellowship with one another. Again, the Bible said in 2 Chronicles chapter number 7 that the Lord's heart would be in his house perpetually. The Lord loves his house. And he wants us to be passionate about his house as well. But no church is any stronger than the homes of its congregation. We are in his house for a few hours a week, but we're in our houses more and more. Our homes then are the incubators where our lives are created. As goes the home, so goes the church. Perhaps there's no greater biblical metaphor for salvation than that of the exodus from Egypt. God's people were in bondage to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians, but by a mighty deliverance, God set them free. With their deliverance came the process of teaching them to live like children of God rather than slaves to sin. Part of the process of their deliverance required a lamb to be slain and the blood of that lamb was necessary to assure life to each home. The death angel was going to pass through the land of Egypt that night, and the firstborn of every house was going to die as punishment for how God's people had been enslaved in Egypt. There was only one way for the house to be saved, and that way was given in Exodus chapter number 12 and verse number 3. 
where God told Moses to speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers. And then he said, a lamb for a house. There had to be a lamb slain for life to come to the home. But notice the last phrase of this verse. The Bible said it had to be a lamb for a house. You see, a fundamental part of God's plan is for each house to have the blood of the lamb applied to it. In the end of all of it, every house needs a lamb. Without the lamb in the house, there's death. Without the lamb in the house, there's bondage. Without the lamb in the house, there's slavery. Without the lamb in the house, there's sadness. It was always in the mind of God for the home to be the place where the lamb was to be. It was his will that every home of his people be identified with the blood of the lamb. God has always been interested in the house. Early in Genesis, the beginning stages of humanity. God warned Noah in chapter number six of Genesis that he was going to destroy the world by a flood. But Noah, the Bible said, found grace in the eyes of God. God gave Noah the plan to build the ark as God instructed him. By building the ark, Noah saved all the animals from the flood, the species. Noah saved the human race His act of obedience is why we're here today. But Noah did not build the ark to save the animals, and Noah did not build the ark to save the human race. Noah didn't build the ark to save you and me. The Bible tells us exactly why Noah built the ark. Hebrews 11 and 7, by faith, Noah, being warned of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark, to the saving of his house. Noah built the ark to save his family. He moved with fear. He didn't stay in one place. When he heard the warning from God, he didn't just sit there and ponder it for a while. The Bible said that he moved. May I tell you, if you're going to save your family, it's going to take action on your part. You cannot stay static and expect your family to find salvation. Noah, as the leader of his home, when he received the word from God, he moved on God's word. He didn't just casually build a boat. The Bible said he moved with fear. Every day for 120 years, he was motivated by one thought. I have to build the ark because I have to save my family. He knew that his wife and children were depending on him to build an ark properly, to build the ark according to God's plans. No shortcuts, no easy ones, no easy way out. There's no way to build an ark the easy way. You build it God's way or you build it no way at all because Noah moved with fear. He knew if I take a shortcut, if I take time off, if I don't give my all to this ark building situation, then my family is at risk for the flood. So every day Noah found a way to roll himself out of bed, to trudge his way down to the building site whether it was felling trees, uh, whether it was shaping them, uh, or driving pegs to hold them together, whether it was collecting pitch from the trees and from, and from the tar pits, whatever it was that he had to do, Noah moved with fear because he was preparing an ark to save his family. You may think the story of Noah is old and antiquated. It's from so long ago that it has little bearing on modern life, family, or culture. But Jesus reminded his listeners in Matthew chapter number 24 and in Luke chapter number 17, he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. He said, when the Lord's going to come back, 
and take his church out of this world. It's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. So that means we know it's going to be a sinful day. We know it's going to be a day when men are eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But it does matter if those things are prioritized above your ark building. Amen. There's nothing wrong with marrying and giving in marriage, but there's a problem when your priorities go away from building an ark to save your family, to live life as usual. And we're living in a day and hour where sin is running rampant and people's lives are so cluttered with the cares of this world. I'm telling you, until the last few days, our lives have been too full for God. I know I'm preaching. I know I'm preaching to good people, but may I tell you something? Sometimes good people get their values mixed up. We become more about the dollar than we are about worshiping God. We make decisions based on how we can earn more and get more and gather more, more than we are about building the ark. We let our kids get involved in activities that get them out of church and away from the youth group and out of the house of God. And we think it's okay because we're just letting them have the same life everybody else has. But my friends and my brothers and sisters, the most important thing you'll ever do in your life is you'll build an ark to the saving of your house. And Jesus said, just like it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. So the story of Noah is very relevant to today. The story of Noah is very relevant to right now. Because the most important priority that every one of us ought to have is God help us to build an ark to save our house. It's time for families to turn their homes into arks. We talk about the church having revival, but that's really not possible unless we get the lamb in our house and we build arks to the saving of our houses. When Joshua was faced with a culture that wanted to go back to Egypt, when those around him were wanting to backslide and go back to bondage in Egypt, when those around him opposed his stand for his faith and obedience to God, Joshua had a firm message for his friends and for his neighbors in Joshua 24 and 15. If it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, then you choose this day who you will serve whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, again, it goes back to Noah, the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see, for Joshua, it was a house thing. He wasn't as concerned with what everybody else was going to do. He had made up his mind. I am going to save my home. I'm going to have revival in my house. If everybody else turns back to Egypt, if everybody else goes back to sin, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm telling you, we need a fresh determination to turn our homes into revival centers. Our house ought to be a place where the presence of God can move. It was a house thing for Joshua. The word house occurs in the Bible 2,026 times in 1,715 different verses. The word home occurs 51 times in 50 verses. Family occurs 123 times in 76 verses. That's a total of 2,200 occurrences in 1,841 verses. May I tell you emphatically that the Bible is a home book, a house book, a family book. God is interested in us having a family revival. Amen. Let me just say it again so you can hear it in your homes uh, throughout this land uh, that God is interested in us having family revivals in our houses. Uh, Perhaps, perhaps that's why we're basically locked in right now because God wants us to turn our homes into revival centers and ark in this flooded land. Just a couple of weeks ago, right as, right as this, this whole situation was, was emerging here, I was in Israel, and the highlight, 
of that trip for me was spending some time in the upper room. To me personally, it was the most impacting part of the entire trip. I sat on what remained of an ancient column in the upper room and I read from, from my, my Bible on my phone, I read Acts chapter number two. And as I sat there in that upper room, I, I became totally overwhelmed spiritually and emotionally by, by what had happened in that room. What happened in that upper room was the birth of the church. It was ground zero for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. From that upper room, Christianity exploded upon the world beginning in Jerusalem and spreading through Judea and Samaria and then to Asia, Africa, and Europe. It was an unprecedented wave of God's power and presence. The remarkable growth of the early church in the book of Acts established the critical role that houses would play in evangelism, missions, and discipleship. In Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 15, Luke reported 120 believers in the upper room. Just 10 days later, in Acts 2, 41, the Bible said 3,000 believed. And then in Acts 4 and 4, howbeit many of them which heard the word believed in the number of the men was about 5,000. In a very short period of time, it went from 120 to 3,000, to 5,000 men. The, the terminology shows that that number did not include women and children. What we're seeing is a massive growth of the church by the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Then Luke, in his writing, moved from the language of addition to the language of multiplication. In Acts chapter number 6 and verse number 1, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied. And then a few verses later in chapter, in chapter 6 and verse 7, and the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. There were no venues in ancient Israel that could consistently house such groups of people. So how did the primitive church initiate growth and discipleship and that dramatic incre increase of people into the church? There are two major factors. First, it was the Holy Ghost working with them. Amen. It was the Holy Ghost working with them. The end of the Gospel of Mark tells us in two verses what the church did after the resurrection and into the book of Acts. In Mark 19, 16 and 19 and 20, it said, So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. That's talking about the ascension, which would be repeated in Acts chapter number 1. And then in verse number 20, after the ascension, the Bible, speaking of the disciples and the believers, in verse 20, it says, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Hallelujah. Almost every time I pray, I ask God to confirm the word with signs following. But the Bible said that after the ascension, the church went forward and they, they went and preached everywhere. And the Bible said the Lord working with them. Amen. The Lord working with them, not for them, but with them. God doesn't want to be our errand boy. He's not our servant. He's more than a miracle machine that at our command, he gives us what we want. God wants to work with us. That means if we'll work, he'll work. If we'll do our part, he'll do his part. They went forth and the Lord working with them. I want God to work with us. Amen. But if he's going to work with us, that means we've got to work too. We've got a job to do. Amen. And so the, are, are y'all, I know y'all out there at home are comfortable. Are y'all all right in here? Amen. A second key component of such rapid growth was revealed in Acts 2, 42 through 47. In Acts 2, 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Amen. May I say 
May I say this just as clearly and plainly as I can. Amen. That this is an apostolic church. I, I've heard of some churches in our area that are shying away from the term apostolic. I'm not shying away from it, not one little bit. I'm embracing it. We are an apostolic church. That means we preach the apostles' doctrine, repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost, the apostles' doctrine. The Bible said they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Preachers that won't preach doctrine aren't worth listening to. Amen. Maybe without a crowd, I might get a little too bold, but I'll tell you, anybody that doesn't preach this truth, anybody that backs up from this truth, anybody that walks away from it, they don't deserve to be listened to. Amen. The church must continue in the apostles' doctrine. This is not the time to lighten up, slack up, or back up. It's not the time to water it down. It's not the time to throw it out. If we've ever needed an apostolic church, it's now. Amen. They had the right doctrine. They had godly fellowship and relationships. They had the right respect for God. And when they had the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and, and prayers, the Bible said that fear came on every soul, respect for God and his power. And when you have that combination of elements, doctrine, fellowship, prayers, and respect in that kind of, a, of an amalgamation of qualities. Uh, that's when miracles and signs and wonders are released. You do not have to compromise the message and you do not have to compromise holiness to get a crowd and to have miracles, signs, and wonders. Uh, if you'll preach the word and you'll pray and you'll have the right kind of relationships, you'll see God move in a mighty way. Praise God. Hallelujah. And in verse 46, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house. Everybody say house to house. From house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They daily were in one accord. Churches that are unified are churches that are powerful. Amen. We need to make unity a priority of our prayers. They were daily in the temple. May I tell you that coming to the house of God, I realize the circumstance we're in right now, but coming to the house of God is vital to the growth of the church. Our corporate worship, it was important to them and it's still important to us, but their revival was not contained to the temple. May I tell you that in my own opinion, that part of the problem with modern religion is we have confined our religion to the walls of the church. Amen. We're all about the house of God, but some people, you couldn't tell if they were Christian if they were walking through Walmart because of the way they carry themselves and the way they act and treat other people. Amen. I, 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 there should have been some amens out in the homes right now. I remember listening to an old radio preacher. He's talking about out there in radio land. Well, out there in internet land, there ought to be some amens right now because I'm telling you that our religion shouldn't just be when we're in the walls of this church. We shouldn't just live for God when we're here. We shouldn't just live holy when we're here. But when we walk out of here, there should not be a change in how we live. Amen. We ought to serve God out there like we do in here. Amen. The Bible said that they were in the temple. You cannot, you cannot dis discount the value of temple worship. Amen. But their revival was not confined to the temple. It was also from house to house. Their revival went home with them. Part of the reason for the dramatic growth and power of the early church was the involvement of their houses in revival. May I tell Bethlehem Church that we can have good church and we can have decent crowds and we can have a good move of the Holy Ghost if all we do is do it when we're here. But if we'll ever get what happens here into our homes, you talk about an explosive revival, that was the key to the growth of the early church. They used their homes for prayer meetings. They used their homes for Bible study. They used their homes for discipleship. And when the church got into their houses, the church exploded in growth from house to house. 
Amen. And the Bible said under those conditions that the Lord added daily, in verse 47, the Lord added daily to the church such as should be saved. Amen. I was at the Western Wall not that many days ago. And when I was in Jerusalem, I, every day I would walk through the old city and find my way to the wall of the temple to pray. I tried my best to remember everybody in our church and to call their names out, many of my friends in ministry and our leaders in our organization. I went every day. And when I, when I went one day, it was, it was raining. And so there was, a, there was a room off to the left, an ancient, an ancient room. And it was filled with, with men in there. And they were, they were singing and worshiping and praying. And they were, they were arm in arm dancing and rejoicing and praising God. It was, a, it was an awesome sight to see. They went to the temple to worship. Amen. And in the, old, in, 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 in the book of Acts, the Bible said they were daily in the temple. And they, they, they praised the Lord. And they, and they prayed. And they, they had the temple element of their worship, but then the Bible said that they went from house to house. Training, preaching, teaching, evangelism happened in their homes. As a matter of fact, the majority of their activity would occur as they gathered from house to house. Thus, the house church, small group numbering less than 40 for sure, usually much smaller, became the primary expression of the early church. Archaeologists have unearthed what they believe to be the first Christian church ever built. It's located in a cave area of Rehab, Jordan, where it's thought that early Christians fled to escape persecution. According to the historians, the church was built around 230 AD. This church is believed, again, to be the oldest church in the world, the first one ever constructed. That history is interesting to me, but the relevant question for us tonight is what did the primitive book of Acts early church do for the first 200 years before this church was built? And what did they do going forward until other communities were affluent enough to build church buildings or the environment safe enough for them to start building churches on a wide scale? What did the church do for the first couple of hundred years what they did was they had church in their homes, gatherings from house to house. The fact is that the birthday of the church in Acts 2 includes both temple worship and house to house gatherings. Let me give you a little quick, a little bit of, of quick history from the Bible and, and we'll talk and we'll, we'll finish up. Acts 12 and 12, when the church faced persecution, Peter was in prison about to be beheaded. And the Bible said that the church gathered in homes to pray, Acts 12 and 12. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. The house of Mary became a house of prayer. Acts 16 and 40, and they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Lydia obviously had a house church, and that's where... That's where Paul and Silas gathered with the church. 1 Corinthians 16 and 19, Paul wrote to the churches of Asia, salute you, Aquila and Priscilla, salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Colossians 4 and 15, salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphos and the church which is in his house. Philemon 1 and 2, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in thy house. It's clear from the evidence of the scripture that the early church was a community of small groups that operated under the authority of the apostles and bishops and elders, the pastors, the leaders. They were not little independent rogue groups, groups doing what they wanted with no authority, wildfire, with no leadership. They were closely connected to the church and the spiritual leadership. The large gatherings in the temple courts offered opportunity for worship and corporate prayer. But the small group provided the possibility of fellowship, relationship building, teaching, prayer, and building of genuine community. 
The closeness of the house gatherings provided an effective means for early Christians to connect people to the Lord, to connect people to God's word, and to build community and relationships and connect people to the mission of God. Think about this. For almost every church, the best way that we have trained people is through our children's ministries over the over the decades, our Sunday school programs. And if you think of it like that, when our children come, what do we do? We put them in small groups, age-appropriate groups. We put them in small groups, and there they learn the Word of God. They become discipled. The small group idea has been something we've embraced without knowing really that's what we were doing for a long time. This principle is one of the reasons we've implemented life groups at Bethlehem Church. When all of this stuff is over, From Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, all over our area, we'll have groups meeting in homes, fellowshipping, enjoying the Word of God, praying one for another. And it's those relationships that are being built that we're watching as people that come into the church. If they get involved in two things, if they get involved in what we call grow class, which is a small group that meets here generally on Wednesdays, and if they get involved in life groups, those people that get involved in those house groups, if you will, They are the ones that grow the fastest, become involved, and we watch as their lives are radically and rapidly changed by the presence of God. Our new members who have gotten into life groups have stayed. The new members who have gotten into grow class and life groups are active in ministry and have been discipled at a much higher rate. I read recently a story about an elderly lady, and I'm closing with this story. I read a story recently about an elderly lady that, went, that was in the hospital dying. As she laid in her hospital bed, her mind had been confused for many days. She would come in and out. Sometimes she would talk about now, and sometimes it was as if she was living 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. She laid in the hospital with these flashbacks from earlier in life. When her elderly, with her elderly husband by her side, her breath was short. It was obvious that these were her final moments on this earth. Our singers can come. But she suddenly gained strength. While laying in the hospital bed, she suddenly gained strength. And she said, my, it's dark. And her husband said, yes, Janet, it's dark. She said, is it night? And he said, yes, my love, it's midnight. And then she said, are all the children in? Her mind taking her back to the early years of marriage when her children were young revealed her concern that all of her children were safely in the house for the night. Her husband gently told her the children are all in. Comforted by those words, she exhaled her final breath and Miss Janet died. The heart of a parent on her dying bed before she released herself to eternity are all the children in. My brothers and sisters, members and guests who are making up our audience right now, are all your children in? Have we turned our homes into arcs? May I say this tonight, we need revivals in our homes. All across our land in our particular communities where we have members of our church, in Potts Camp and Holly Springs and Hickory Flat, Olive Branch and Bahalia and Ashland and New Albany and Edda and West Union, Myrtle, Ekru, Pontotoc, Oxford, Water Valley, Waterford. This church has a wide reach and we need our homes to become arcs. And I pray that wherever you are right now listening to this, that you would begin to pray. If you're in your home right now, I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. 
Noah moved with fear and he built an ark to the saving of his house. A lamb for a house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Oh God, that we would set the right priorities right now. God, that we would cause our hearts to become captivated with turning our homes into revival centers. In the name of Jesus, help us, God, to understand that the real way to have revival is that our homes become full of the Holy Ghost. So as you're praying with me right now in your living rooms, in your bedrooms, in your family rooms, with your families gathered around, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the Holy Ghost to begin to move in people's homes. God, that where these good men and women and young people and children are gathered together, I pray for the Holy Ghost to be poured out right now. God, help us to turn our homes into revival centers. God, I pray for those who have discord and disunity and dysfunction in their home. I pray, God, let the peace of the Holy Ghost begin to move in that place. God, where there's rebellion from the children, God, I pray, Lord, let submission come and let the anointing of the Holy Ghost begin to bring families together in the name of Jesus. Come on, can you help me pray right now? God, let my house be filled with your presence. Let my home be filled with your glory, God. Let the Holy Ghost move in my house, God. Let my house be a house of prayer. God, I pray, Lord Jesus, touch my family, touch my children. God, bathe my house with the glory of your presence. Walk into this place right now. Come on, help me pray. Come on, moms and dads, lay your hands on your children. Maybe walk through your house and say, God, let your presence move in this place. God, turn the tide of this world out of this place. I rebuke the enemy, oh God, and I pray the Holy Ghost to move from house to house. Let the Holy Ghost fill in Jesus' name. Amen. As they're singing, you can slip your hand up in the air. Don't be ashamed to worship in your house. Don't be intimidated to turn your house into a house of worship. Amen. You ought to lift your hands right now. You ought to lift your voice. And you ought to say, God, let this be a house of worship. And if there's any reason where you don't feel comfortable moving in the spirit in your home, you ought to pray right now, God, whatever it is, I got to get it right. Because I need this to be from house to house. A lamb for my house, God. As for me and my house, we're going to serve you. Oh, that's right. Let's pray. As for me and my house. that's never been baptized in Jesus' name. We'll do everything we can to arrange for you to come. We'll baptize you. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost right now in your house. It's just as simple as lifting your hands to heaven and receiving the goodness of God.
in my house. Ask for me in my house. Declare that over your family. Ask for me in my house. We're going to be. Ask for me in my house. We're going to be free. Ask for me in my house. Ask for me in my house. We're going to be free. Ask for me in my house. We will serve the Lord. Ask for me in my house. I proclaim it. Ask Oh, me. 